Okay, now let's get to work and start learning about how to interpret uh, electron pushing arrows. So um, the first thing that uh, I want to do is to um, basically go over what are the different types of uh, electron pushing arrows and uh, how to interpret them. So uh, let's look at an example. Okay, so let's try to uh, draw the product that is suggested by uh, this electron pushing arrow. Remember that another name for an electron pushing arrow is a curved arrow for the obvious reason that they're usually drawn uh, curved. Uh, now I want to just kind of go through the, the basic patterns here. So rather than thinking about actual atoms or molecules, I'm just going to use placeholders like X and Y. So X and Y could be any two atoms. Usually these atoms will be part of a bigger molecule, but right now I, I just want to uh, look at very simplified patterns of what the electron pushing arrows would indicate. Uh, maybe you might want to stop the video now and try on your own to draw what would uh, be suggested by this electron pushing arrow. Okay, maybe you gave that a shot and now we can go ahead and draw that in. Well, you always want to ask where are the electrons coming from and where are the electrons going to? Remember that the electron pushing arrows, why are they called electron pushing arrows? Because they tell you how the electrons are moving. Um, that's an important point right there. The, the electron pushing arrows don't tell you how atoms are moving. They tell you how the electrons are moving. Well, where are these electrons coming from? It's pretty clear, isn't it, that the electrons are coming from this lone pair. The tail of this arrow is on this lone pair. Um, so the electrons are coming from there. Um, so uh, uh, we can erase the lone pair in this picture. There used to be a lone pair on this X, but it's going to be gone because the electrons are leaving from there. Now, where are the electrons going to? Uh, well, you can see they're either go moving over to the Y over here. Uh, you might have thought that they were going to move into a lone pair on the Y, but that's not what this arrow indicates. Instead, the electrons are going to a bond between the X and the Y. Uh, so here was the correct answer. Um, the electrons are moving from the lone pair and moving to this bond between the X and the Y. Um, in fact, let's draw the electrons in that bond. So I'll put in two dots to indicate the two electrons in that bond. Uh, now you probably know that usually in, usually in chemistry, even though we know that bonds um, represent two electrons, even though that we know that a, a covalent bond is made up of two electrons, we don't usually actually draw the electrons in the bond. Uh, however, uh, in, in these videos, I, I think I'm usually going to actually draw the electrons in the bond because I think that's going to help us to keep track of how the electrons are actually moving. So let's actually show that, uh, so you can actually see here that the electrons came from these two dots from this lone pair. And now the electrons are represented by these two dots that are inside the bond. So hopefully this already makes it a little bit clearer what we mean when we say that this is an electron pushing arrow. It's showing us how the electrons used to be in the lone pair, and now they're in the bond. Okay, so uh, let's uh, discuss some other uh, important uh, features here. Um, so I, I think one of the things that uh, would be most difficult here is that it would be easy to think that we were forming a lone pair on the Y. After all, the head of this arrow is pointing directly at the Y. It might have been easy to think that we were just going to form a new lone pair on the Y. So, so how would you know that you're not doing that? Um, well, first of all, you just never do a lone pair to lone pair transition. you never take a lone pair from one atom and make it into a lone pair on a different atom. That's just never done. So I'm going to cross that out. All right, this is an important idea right here. We never take a lone pair from one atom and make it into a lone pair on a different atom. Well, you can see in this case that we did take the lone pair, uh, that the yeah, electron started in, as a lone pair on the X. Um, so they can't turn into a lone pair on the Y because that would violate this rule that we just learned over here. You never have a lone pair to lone pair transition. All right, that means, uh, so that should make it clear that instead the electrons must be going to a bond between the X and the Y. Uh, and, and here's one other good way to think about it. Um, we could think that atoms either, uh, we could think that atoms either lack, share, or own 
a pair of electrons. We could think that an atom is either lacking, sharing, or owning the electrons. And we can see what, that, what I mean by that by examples. For example, um, what's the relationship between this X and this lone pair? Well, doesn't this X really here own the lone pair? This X has full of possession of that lone pair. And what's the relationship between the Y in the starting materials and the lone pair? Well, the right word there would be lack, right? The Y over here lacks any ownership of that lone pair. The Y over here is lacking any connection with that lone pair. And how about what's the relationship between the X and the pair of electrons in our product? Well, now the X is sharing the electrons with the Y, right? That's what a covalent bond means. It means that you're sharing the electrons. So in this picture, the X is sharing those electrons. And how about the Y? Well, that's also sharing the electrons. In this picture, that the Y lacked any connection to the pair of electrons, but now the Y is sharing that pair of electrons in the bond. Uh, so I hope it's clear why we would say here the X owns the electrons, because they're a lone pair on the X. Here the Y lacks any connection to this pair of electrons. Um, and in this case, both the X and the Y are sharing the pair of electrons. By the way, of course, um, I should mention that obviously there would be other pairs of electrons involved here too, that there could be other relationships. For example, the, the Y atom here probably has some other lone pairs. It's per totally possible that the Y has some other lone pairs that it owns, and it might have some other bonds as well that we're not showing. So all we're doing right here is focusing on this one pair of electrons. If we focus on this one pair of electrons, we can say that the X owns it and Y lacks it. And here the X and the Y are sharing. All right, so, so notice what's happening here. What types of transitions are we making? Well, the X is going from owning the electrons to sharing them. The X over here went from owning the pair of electrons to sharing them. And the Y went from lacking the pair of electrons to sharing them. In the starting materials, the Y lacked the electrons completely, and here the Y was sharing them. So the Y is making this type of transition. All right, and it turns out that both of those are perfectly legal and allowable transitions. Uh, and you can also go in the other direction, even though I didn't show that in this picture. Um, if you started by sharing electrons, you might eventually end up lacking them completely. Or if you start by sharing the electrons, you might end up owning them completely in a lone pair. The one type of, uh, the one type of transition you can't make is like this. Maybe you can already see why. It's too big of a jump. You can't go from completely lacking the electrons to owning them. And you can't go from owning them to completely lacking them. So I'm going to cross this out. Remember, this is a transition on this side that we never make. We never take a pair of electrons that were completely lacked and turn them into one that were owned by that same um, uh, atom. You can never go from owning to lacking. And this explains, again, why we didn't take this lone pair and make it into a lone pair on the Y. So remember, this would have been the wrong thing to do. Let's talk a little bit more about why this would have been the wrong thing to do. Well, if we had done this, in this picture, the X would have completely lacked any connection to the electrons, and the Y would now completely own the electrons. Well, those are both uh, unallowable transitions. We can't take uh, a pair that the X owns and turn that into a pair that the X lacks completely. That would be too big of a jump. We're not allowed to do that. And uh, similarly, we can't take this pair of electrons that was completely lacked by the Y in this picture and turn it into a pair that's owned by the Y in this picture. Again, that would be too big of a jump. So in this little diagram here, you can only move uh, by one step. You can go from the bottom to the middle, or the middle to the bottom, or the top to the middle, or the middle to the top. But you can't go from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top. You can't jump from uh, having an atom that lacks the electrons to owning them completely, or from owning them completely to lacking them. This is another explanation for why you can't have a lone pair to lone pair transition. Uh, we can't have a lone pair to lone pair transition because it would be too big of a jump. The atom that used to own the electrons would end up completely lacking them. That's too big of a jump. And the atom that used to completely lack the electrons would end up owning them. And that's also too big of a jump. All right, so again, uh, remember that I was drawing this down here to show some wrong products, products that are not suggested by this arrow. So now I'll erase those incorrect products. Okay, so what, what have we learned how to do so far? Well, we've learned how to take a lone pair and turn it into a sigma bond. Uh, 
Uh, I hope that you're far enough along in your class to know what a sigma bond is. Uh, but anyway, single bonds are sigma bonds. Um, so we've learned how to take a lone pair and turn it into a single bond, also called a sigma bond. Remember, this is the symbol for sigma.